Chris, thanks for joining me this afternoon. Hey, I'm hey, sorry, hey. I had something on mute over here. That's okay. Always I just important. gave you a wonderful introduction talking about that, that, that roaming district, that wide ranging district that you have, uh, that includes all of Green and Sullivan and parts of Delaware, Columbia, Ulster, Ulster uh, Otsego, and that you're the ranking member of the Assembly's um, Agriculture Committee. Uh, but thank most of all, I can call you my friend, and I and I appreciate and I appreciate that. Same so, here. Welcome. Um, you know the uh, early April. Um, you know we're always concerned about. A lot of us uh, are concerned about what's happening with the New York State budget. There's probably no single action that the legislature can take that takes during the year uh, that has more impact on us as, as business owners, but us as residents as well. So what can you tell me, tell all of us about what's happening right now with the budget? Well, we, we passed the budget, uh, let me see, today's Friday. Uh, yeah. It was early Thursday morning. The Senate actually uh, concluded earlier than we did. Um, we were, I think it was about three o'clock in the morning Wednesday morning, we went into recess and then uh, went back at it around nine o'clock <clears throat> uh, Wednesday morning. And it was about 12.05, 12.10 on Thursday morning that we eventually uh, passed everything. Now I say we eventually passed everything. Many of the, uh, uh, many of the budget bills, actually all the budget bills I voted negative on and <clears throat> to be quite honest, it was a very irresponsible budget. 
uh, as far as I was concerned, uh, priorities were not looked upon. Uh, we took all this money from the federal government and instead of doing it the proper way and budgeting things for the next four or five years with that influx of money, mm -hmm. they threw it all out there at once. And, and that was we, about $12 billion that came yeah, out to the state. Uh, yeah, I mean, here are some facts. Um, this budget is 20% more than last year's budget, which is almost $19 billion more than last year's budget. It's a total of $212 billion. Um, you know, it just, like I said, what concerns me is, is that we, we gave, we gave quite a bit to an awful lot. And next year when it comes budget time and we have to look some of these folks in the eye and say, well, we took care of you last year, but we need to cut you this year. Mm -hmm. um, it's not going to work. Uh, you know, I, I pleaded with folks to let's do a four or five year plan. Um, you know, they're, you know, besides all this, Ray, they're looking at raising revenue eight to nine billion dollars in the next two years. And how do you think they're going to do that? Well, where, yeah, where is that going to be coming from? They're going to raise taxes. Uh, you know, they, they, here are some, here are some facts. They uh, initiated an ultra millionaires tax. Um, and these taxes will go into effect until the year 2027. And anybody that makes a million to $5 million, your tax rate's going up to 9.65%. Anyone who makes 5 million to 25 million, your tax rate's gonna go up to 10.30%. And anyone that makes 25 million or more, 10.90%. Uh, they're, they're saying that this new tax rate would generate between, uh, between 4.5 billion and $5 billion. Now, you know, I can understand that, but but here's the issue, and, and I keep hearing my friends on the other side, I will say, well, millionaires aren't going to leave this state. Well, they're dead wrong. They already have. Uh, a lot of, you know, New York used to be the top state, actually the top state in the world um, for millionaires and billionaires. Mm -hmm. Well, Beijing, China just took over that uh, title. But if you look at the population increases in Florida and Texas in the last 10 years, you can see where a lot of New Yorkers have went. And most of those were people who were wealthy. So, you know, how are you going to make up this tax base if these wealthy people leave the state? Of course, you know where they're going to go. They're going to go to the middle class or the lower middle class, the working people, and they're just going to tax us higher. Um, so again, I felt that it was very, uh, very irresponsible on their part. Uh, they're also going to uh, tax the corporate 6.5%. Um, it's going to go up to 7.25% through 2024. And that they're saying uh, is going to generate 1.1 billion. Um, you know, so of course I was, uh, listen, I don't want to see anybody get taxed. I understand that we have to do it, um, but I don't care if you're um, middle class, lower middle class or wealthy. Um, the last thing we wanna do is tax the living daylights out of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chris, let's talk about some of the programs that are built into this budget though, that might provide some relief for, for small businesses. You're, you know, you're a small business owner for many years. Yeah. Um, so you understand the, the concepts, the, the, the challenges that small business owners have. What are some of the programs that are built into this budget that, that could actually help some of our small businesses? That's some of the problem, Ray. That, and that's one of the reasons why I voted against this budget because it didn't do enough. Yeah. And here's a perfect example. They put 2.1 billion, and let me just say this. They originally wanted 3.5 billion and that's what a B. That's what a B. But they actually put it, they actually agreed upon between the two houses and the governor, $2.1 billion stimulus for undocumented immigrants. And by the way, for people who are felons who, who have been in jail. Guess how much they budgeted for small business relief? What's that? 
888 billion, or I'm sorry, 888 million with an M. And that's my problem. About 30% of, of yeah. what was going to that other group. Yes. And, you know, here's the thing. The small businesses in our communities are really the fabric that hold us together. The people yeah. that the people that own those businesses, they hire our friends, our neighbors, our family members. And most of the people that are involved in community organizations, like our fire departments, our EMS, our Rotary Clubs, our Eagles Clubs, our Kiwanis Clubs, these are people that come out of these small businesses. They're either employees or they're owners. And it, to me, it was a slap in the face. Another reason why I voted against this budget is because their priorities were backwards. The small businesses should have been the people who we prioritized. You know, a lot of these businesses have been put out of business by no fault of their own. Uh -huh. It was done by the government. Yeah. They, they were made, and, and you ask anybody that owns a business that's been trying to get relief, either from the state or federal government, what hoops they've had to go through. I have people still today, it's over a year ago, from March of last year till now, that are still having trouble recovering any of their unemployment claims. Unbelievable. And, but we have no problem taking $2.1 billion of our money and putting it towards people that we don't even know who they are, where they've come from, why they're here. But we have small businesses, uh, families that have been businesses for years and years and years. And to me, it was a slap in the face. You know, only $888 million to about $1 billion is all we could muster. You know, and I'll give you another perfect example. Yeah. Other areas in the budget. I've always been a big advocate for um, uh, folks with de uh, developmental disabilities, mm -hmm. our ARCs. Mm -hmm. Also, the people that care for them, our CDPAP and, and home health care workers. Just to give you a, the, the Spina Bifida Association uh, in Albany, they asked for $150,000. Originally, there was no money in the budget for them. Finally, they found a way to come up with $75,000 for them. Now, you're talking a $212 billion budget, okay? And that's all we could come up with. And pretty much our ARCs... Um, and the CDPAP and home uh, home healthcare workers, the money that goes towards them was kept pretty much flat, maybe a two or three percent increase here or there. What are we telling our people? It just doesn't it, it doesn't make any sense to me. You know, now with all this being said, there were some good areas. Um, listen, you can't you as much as I complain about the one billion dollars for small businesses, Ray. At least we got one billion dollars. Okay. So what? That sounds great. So what kind of programs are included in there? That's the problem. You need to read about seventeen pages to figure out exactly who qualifies, how you qualify. I can tell you this: I have a big announcement on Tuesday, and you're going to be involved in it. You just don't know it yet. All right. Looking forward to it. I can't say much more. I'm going to be involving Schoharie County Chamber, Delaware County Chamber, Green County Chamber. We're going to have a big announcement on Tuesday, and then we're actually going to be doing a Facebook live program on Thursday that I'm going to include you in. All right. Lo Lois is going to be calling you and filling you in all on the details, but it has to do with one of these programs that came in the budget that hopefully I'm going to be the first one to be able to get out there and, and get some assistance to some of our people Great. in my district. Excellent. Um, but, you know, some of the other good areas, which I think also help with economics, is our school and our education. Absolutely. Uh, there were, I think that our schools and education have been short, uh, have been funded short for many, many years. So, you know, there was $29.5 billion uh, in support for school aid this year, which was a 12% increase. Um, and the federal funds uh, would also fund it at about $41.1 billion. This is much needed money, uh, especially for our smaller school districts. We just uh -huh. need to make sure uh, that our school districts in our rural areas get their fair share. Um, there were also other programs, uh, you know, having to do with higher education that also more funding and uh, money, much needed money for transportation. 
Uh, there was also money in the budget uh, in increase again uh, for infrastructure uh, and for broadband, which uh, broadband's the big thing. There was another $500 million allocated for uh, rural upstate broadband. Good. Um, what about cell phone service? Because that's, that's you know, we have a, for the most part, we have a pretty, since I think we have a broadband network here in Delaware County that is the envy of most regions across uh, rural New York State. What about cell phone service? What yes. Can, what well, can the we do there? Part of the telecommunications, the budget for telecommunications included uh, for cell phones as well. So, you know, hopefully we'll get some more towers put up throughout the rural areas that will be helpful because I, it's like I've said to you before and I brought it to many people's attention that having the, these types of services is not about convenience. It's really a safety, a public safety oh, issue. Absolutely. You know, uh, I can tell you right now, right here in front of the Apple Barrel in my hometown of Schoharie, there's no cell phone coverage. Mm -hmm. In Catskill, out in front of the, uh, in Greene County, in front of the uh, county office building, there's no cell phone coverage. In the year 2021, we shouldn't be having to worry about those problems. So uh, those are some of the areas that I was happy about in the budget that we were, you know, that funding was put aside for telecommunications. Now, my hope is though, is that our smaller uh, um, family owned telecommunications companies like Del Delhi uh, Telephone, yeah. Margaretville, Margaretville Telephone, those folks that have supported our communities, uh, Middleburg Telephone in, in my yeah. home county, my hope is, is that those uh, companies that are family owned, that have been supporting our communities for almost a hundred years in some cases, that, 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 you know, that these, that this work will come to them because their employees are our neighbors. Uh -huh. So, you know, let's hope that that, you know, let's hope that that happens. You know, again, overall, we spend too much in New York state. Um, you know, let me just throw some facts out there. New York's budget is more than Texas and Florida combined. I say that again, New York state's budget is more than Texas and Florida combined. Ouch. We have less residents, less residents than either one of those states. And let me tell you this, we almost spend as much as California and California has 20 million more residents than the state of New York. Uh, to me, it was an irresponsible budget. Like I said at the beginning, mm -hmm. that influx of federal cash should have been looked at and it should have budget, been budgeted at a five or six year uh, period of time. And, I, and one of the reasons why I say that is education, because those are the folks that are going to come back, they're going to fix everything this year, what they've been through with the pandemic, they got this influx of cash. How are you going to go to them next year, and give them the 41.1 billion that you gave them this year, when the money's gone? Mm -hmm. Just to me, it you know, it was irresponsible. It was a wish list uh, for certain, you know, but again, it was to me, it wasn't prioritized um, and it wasn't done with common sense. Uh, Chris, I, we only have a couple more uh, minutes and I appreciate the time that you've given me this afternoon. Uh, I mentioned that you were the ranking, you are the ranking member of the, uh, of the Assembly Agriculture Committee. Uh, one of the pieces that has probably nothing really to do with the budget, but was included in the legislation uh, was the legalization of, of marijuana. Uh, any, any reaction to that? What are we, what are we looking at there? Well, I, well, I'm glad you brought up agriculture because you know it's near and dear to my heart. Absolutely. I, I, I was a dairy farmer. Uh, I just want to throw in two things that I was very happy about in the budget. I called back, like, I called on the governor last March to add another $25 uh, million to the Nourish New York program. And thankfully, they did. It's now a $50 million project, uh, program. Uh, the other thing was they had pulled the $4.5 million out of agritourism, out of that budget. I argued, fought, kicked, squirmed. And thankfully, Donald Lepardo listened, who is the yeah. chair of our ag committee. And lo and behold, the $4.5 million was put back in the budget. Great. Now, with regards to marijuana, I voted against the bill. And I'll tell you why. Because the language in the bill said that 
distressed, they, they use the term distressed farmers, that distressed farmers would be the, the ones that would be eligible to grow this crop. Well, I got to tell you something, Ray. I don't know any farmer in New York State that isn't distressed. Um, they also, I thought it was very disingenuous of how they mentioned the farmer through the debate of this. Um, we saw the same thing happen uh, last uh, two years ago when they uh, legalized the CD, uh, CBG and um, some of the other uh, components. And it didn't work out quite, the, you know, they, they, they said this was going to save the New York farmer. That isn't what happened. Right. What happened was more people decided to be a farmer. Mm -hmm. And that's my concern with this. There are 14 different licenses and permits that you need for this program. Um, you know, and but my biggest complaint, the, the biggest reason why I had to vote in the negative on this uh, was the roadside impairment testing and the lack of. Um, I honestly, I could care less if somebody wants to use marijuana for whatever reason, if they use it responsibly, they do it on their own time. I really don't have an issue. Who am I to decide whether it's right or wrong? Sure. It's the same thing with alcohol. Mm -hmm. But public safety is the most important. We have tests in place when people use alcohol. Unfortunately, we still don't have a test in place to be able to test somebody's impairment with the use of marijuana. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to have to stay uh, negative on this issue until, until they come up with a sobriety test, uh, you know, we can't have people driving down the road um, that, you know, that their impairment, their ability to drive is, you know, is in danger because of the use of this drug. Chris, thank you so much for, for spending some time with, with me this afternoon. How, if folks want to get in contact with your offices, how can they do that? You got a great team. Uh, well, that, can, that works they, with you. They can do a couple different things. They can go to the New York State Assembly website and go to my page. It has uh, phone numbers for all three of my offices and my email address. Or as I've always give out my personal cell phone, 518-365-1573. I'm a 24-7 assembly member. You have a problem, I do all I can to help. That's my cell phone number. And I also have a Facebook page uh, on Facebook. I don't use Twitter much. I do have a Twitter page too, but the best way to get a hold of me is either through email, my cell phone, or Facebook. And of course, in order to catch you at one of those, uh, at, at that number, you need to be somewhere where there's service. Exactly. Hopefully, hopefully that will get better in the, uh, in the coming months and years here. Well, we're looking forward to that and I'm looking forward to whatever this big surprise is that you have for me on Tuesday. So I'm looking forward to the, getting that phone call as soon as, as soon as I get back into, into cell service. I think Lois, is, uh, Lois has you on the list. You're, you're number one. She's gonna be calling you and filling you in. All right, I'm looking forward to that. Chris Tegg is our assembly representative uh, for the 102nd Assembly District here in New York State, and that includes places like right here in Roxbury. So, Chris, thanks for joining me this afternoon on Catskills Commerce. You got it, Ray. God bless you, and God bless all your listeners. Give my best to Lily, the whole group, and look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks, I Ray. sure will. You too. See you soon. Bye-bye. Well, Mike Martucci is going to be joining us in just a few minutes. Um, but first, let's take a look at our weather forecast for the central Catskills and the western Catskill Mountains. For the remainder of the afternoon, uh, it's going to be kind of cloudy, a little bit of sun, a little bit of cloud, maybe a little shower reaction. Highs this afternoon going up to about 63 degrees. And overnight tonight, lows going down to about 44 degrees. Really rather pleasant. Chance of some showers, of course, overnight. And for tomorrow, some patchy fog, then mostly cloudy skies with highs tomorrow, according to the National Weather Service, going up to 68 degrees. I always think somehow they seem to be a rather more optimistic than I am. Um, 
And then on Sunday, we have some showers in the forecast with highs on Sunday going up again to the mid to upper 60s. Uh, and just taking a peek at Monday, we're going to have a, a little bit more moderating uh, temperatures with highs all parts of uh, for the next few days of next week uh, going uh, up to the low to um, low to mid 60s with chance of showers it looks like um, going into the early part of next week. As I mentioned as I mentioned a little a little while ago uh, the Delaware County Travel Guide is now available, um, hopefully at a store, at a, at a business near you. If you really uh, tells the stories of Delaware County, uh, what the chamber has tried to do with that travel guide is create more of an experiential guide to, to Delaware County, rather than um, page after page of, of lists of lists of lists that you see really much more of a magazine format. Uh, of course, we're always interested in getting your reaction. So when you see that Delaware County Travel Guide out at your, uh, somewhere nearby that you're visiting, a restaurant or a store, pick one up, take a look at it and uh, send us a note. Let us know what, what you think. Now I'm pleased, really thrilled uh, to introduce to you, uh, one of our state senators. Uh, Mike Martucci was elected to uh, the New York State Senate this past November, uh, representing the 42nd Senate District. And that includes all of Sullivan County, parts of Orange, parts of Delaware, parts of Ulster. Uh, and he's also the ranking member of both the mental health and the Economic Development Committees. We don't think there's any connection in between those two committees. Um, and it's my, it's, it's truly my honor to, to introduce to you another, another friend, uh, Mike Martucci. Mike, thanks for joining me this afternoon on Catskills Commerce. Ray, thank you for having me as always. It's always great to join you, especially on a beautiful Friday like this. It is a beautiful Friday out there. But of course, it's always sunny here in Delaware County. Uh, Mike, the, uh, I just had Chris Tag on. We were talking about uh, some of the things that came out of the, the, the New York State budget. Um, I'm gonna ask you the same question I started with Chris. Give me some, some initial reactions to the state budget that was passed earlier this week. Well, Ray, I mean, there were some good things in this state budget. So I'll start with a positive, you know, certainly things, yeah, certainly things that I have advocated strongly for. Uh, there were some district-based things that were really important to me, such as job preservation. Uh, the governor had recommended the closure of um, several OCFS, Office of Children and Family Services locations okay. across the state. One of them was in the 42nd district. So I was able to successfully advocate uh, keeping that facility open, which was important, protected hundreds of good paying CSEA and, and PEF union jobs. You know, look, we also saw a tremendous, uh, a tremendous support of our schools, largely. Our school districts made out really good in this budget, mm -hmm. um, thanks to the help of some federal aid, of course, as well. Uh, but I think an appropriate um, investment was made in education, which was huge. Uh, and there were also other good aspects of this budget. Uh, I'll point to certainly the legalization of um, the uh, online sports betting, which is something that we've all been looking forward to here in the state of New York for a long time. I think it's a, a very uh, a good revenue generating measure and will make New York a little bit more competitive in that arena for sure. Um, but then unfortunately, some of the huge support items, items that I would have liked to see us double, triple, quadruple down on in terms of support, like support to our small businesses, like property tax support. Uh, some of those things, although they were included in this budget and at sizable amounts, this was our opportunity to make bigger investments in those areas. And it was an opportunity that was missed. Uh, you know, another thing that I opposed in this budget strongly was nearly $5 billion of new taxes. Uh, you know, the Democrat majorities and the governor has have larded in $5 billion of new taxes, quite frankly, at a time when I think New Yorkers and businesses can afford it the least. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about some of that support that's going to, to, to businesses, particularly small businesses. Uh, Chris had mentioned that there were about 800 million or so 
uh, that's slated for uh, for support for small businesses. What are some of those things that we can expect to see? Sure. So Chris is absolutely right. Eight hundred million dollars was included in the final budget deal in terms of support for small businesses. Some of these funds are focused at a very important industry, which is our restaurant industry, which has suffered tremendously. Um, it sure in, has. Yeah, more than others. Um, so there's some relief for our restaurants that's available through grant, a competitive grant program, okay. uh, an application program, uh, mm -hmm. and then also um, other general support, things that would include assisting businesses with rent payments. I've heard from both tenants and landlords alike about the tremendous stress that has occurred. Uh, and, you know, I would tell you too, this budget also included $2.3 billion of rent relief, which, you know, for a lot of my district means finally help for landlords because there have been both commercial and residential eviction moratoriums that have been on the books for months and months and months now. And I've been hearing from both landlords and tenants alike who are tremendously stressed over this, tenants who have no ability to pay and landlords whose bills just keep coming with absolutely no relief in sight. So what I'm focused on now is getting this relief out the door and in the pockets of the people that need it the most. Mike, let's talk, let's, let's look at that landlord issue a little bit because that's an area that really, really has not been talked about. Um, you know, the, the perception is that, well, landlords don't need any help. You know, we all have this, uh, you know, uh, snidely whiplash uh, kind of, I'm sorry, my, my cultural, my childhood showing there a little bit, um, that, you know, landlords bad. Um, and what do they need help for? But, and, and this kind of painted the, this image that there are all these large landlords and they can just, they can float this. But, you know, the, in most cases, those landlords, at least again, in your district, uh, here in Delaware County, they're small businesses. Uh, you know, they're mom and pops. Yeah, you bet, right? So look, one of the other hats that I wear in Albany is I sit on the housing committee. And you know, I've had a front row seat for the past several months on this very issue. Uh, let me tell you about my frustration really as it surrounds this particular issue. Uh -huh. In the first stimulus package, which was rewind back to December of 2020, New York State was given about $1.3 billion to address this very problem. Then again, in March in the second stimulus package, New York was given another billion dollars. So here we sit today on $2.3 billion and this state, has again and again distributed a habitual inability to get this money out to provide relief. And you're absolutely right. You know, in my district, I don't represent New York City. I don't have mega landlords here. I don't have landlords right. like tens of thousands of units. What I have are people calling my office just like last week, somebody saying to me, look, I'm a widow. I live on a fixed income. I have a two family home. I rent one half of my house and I live in the other. And I need that rental income to buy my groceries and pay for my prescription medication. Uh -huh. And my tenant hasn't paid me in six months. Uh -huh. So these are the landlords that I'm out fighting for right now, because what we need and what we need right now immediately is for this state to get its act together so that these tenants and landlords can apply for this money and we can get our landlords paid. Our landlords did not get property tax relief. Our landlords didn't receive any of the other support that they needed. And then last and finally, we have so many small landlords of working landlords who buy a property for an investment and they're paying a mortgage on that property. Uh -huh. These are individuals who use monthly rent payments to meet their debt obligations to banks and a mortgage. Okay. So in so many cases, what we're dealing with here is a situation where this state has shoveled off a problem onto the backs of our small landlords, where it's not, it simply doesn't belong there. So uh, I was pleased that this budget, um, although largely they were federal funds, took money and directed it to this very issue. As long as they're directed toward the issue, I don't care where those funds come from. So you think we're going to see some some something hit the streets fairly soon that's going well, to provide can, some relief? I would tell you this, you know. So I uh, this was this was an item that I debated on the floor of the Senate at about twenty minutes to three in the morning on Tuesday, as we were voting on this budget in the middle of the night, which unfortunately is standard operating procedure in all. Yeah. Media. And. Um, what I was told is that uh, OTADA, which is the Office of Temporary Disability, is going to be administering the program because the executive feels like that, that, uh, that entity has the ability to get these dollars out the door the quickest. So what my promise is to everybody is I'm going to be right on top of this. Partly the reason, right, is because if we don't distribute at least 65% of the funds by September 30th of this year, the federal government can claw those dollars back. 
So there is an opportunity here to miss the boat in a big way. So time wow. is of the essence, not only for our landlords, but also to take advantage of the program. Good, good. Um, Mike, let's get let's move to a topic that every time I see you, I bring up. Let's talk about cell phone service. What can, what's 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 in there? What what can we? You know, we're we're in a rural area. We know that our that the cell providers uh, need that financial incentive in order to in to to further develop this 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 network. Uh, in, in the stretches of, of rural New York. Um, is there going to be something in there that's going to help those, those telecommunication companies and incentivize them to, uh, to expand those networks? So, Ray, you know, the first thing I'll talk about is this was one of the disappointing parts of this budget. Uh, you know, certainly cell phone and broadband are not identical, but they're connected. Sure. And one of the things that had happened here in New York, and you rewind uh, back to 2019, is that the state actually put in place what's called the, what we call the fiber tax, which was a tax that was applied to uh, companies that were building out fiber networks, uh, cable networks across our state that charges them for running these networks in state right of ways. Uh -huh. Basically, these are DOT right of ways. As we all know, our cable and our electric runs right next to DOT highways, next to roads. So first, from my perspective, this was the opportunity to repeal that tax, which is a blockade. It's a Berlin Wall right in the way of making important progress on both the broadband and the cell phone front. Um, so the first is, uh, you know, I, I was very, very... Um, it was very unfortunate to see, and I was upset to see, that we didn't take advantage of repealing that provision. You know, second, pointing to what you're talking about, I believe here a market-based approach is the way that we need to go. And when I say that, what I mean is what you said, we have to incentivize cell phone companies to build out in rural areas. So uh, right now I carry a bill, which is a S5625. And what this bill does, uh, it actually applies to broadband, but I'll explain how it relates to cell service and how it can be expanded to cell service. But what this does is create a refundable tax credit to individuals and small businesses, not to cable companies or cable providers or cell phone companies, but rather the individuals and small businesses. So they can pool their resources and use those resources to go to a provider to negotiate development. So for example, if there were an area or a neighborhood that didn't have broadband service, everyone who lives in that neighborhood would get that tax credit. And then those neighbors could pool that tax credit to incentivize a company to come in and bring that service to their area. So what I would tell you is that same sort of plan can be implemented with respect to cell phone service. Places uh -huh. where there are gaps, I think the state should be using the tax code to incentivize businesses to build out in those areas. Um, you know, again, what we have to acknowledge is that New York has a terrible business climate. We know that. I know that. You know that. That's what we work on every single day is making it easier to do business here. Right. And whatever we do has to be a step to encourage this build out. Um, and not discourage it. So again, what I would say is, I think we need to be using tax code in a way that is going to be incentivizing these businesses. And I think that this is just another example of how we can do that in a good way to build out cell phone development in small towns, in cities, in rural areas. Um, but again, like I said, the effort to include the repeal of that fiber tax was rejected in the budget. Uh, unfortunately, the, the Democrats who control the legislature uh, killed that provision yet again this year. I feel that that was a missed opportunity in a big way, which would have been a step toward uh, not only the cell service, but also the broadband. But again, I look forward on my side to promoting these market-based approaches because the top-down approaches just have not been effective. Right. No, they really haven't been. And that, that fiber tax that you talk about, um, just to, to put some real numbers on this for, for folks, um, that was about $20,000 a mile uh, that those, those companies are paying. And, and it's not just, the, uh, it's not just the, the Verizons and the frontier uh, uh, telecommunication companies of the world. It's Margaretville Telephone, it's Delhi Telephone, it's Hancock Telephone. It's our, it's our local telcos that are so inter integrated uh, to the communities. Uh, that are paying that as, as well. And um, yeah, I look forward to, to working with you on, on coming up with some market-based approaches, but until we can get that 
uh, that burden of that fiber tax removed, it's that's going to be a tough one. That's going to be a real slog. Right. Right, right. And at the end of the day, you know what? These are all taxes that go right down to rate payers. That's the big sure. issue, right? Is that we're talking about a tax that every single person shoulders. And like you said, these are not taxes that big businesses are shouldering. These are taxes that are coming right down on rate payers in Delaware County, Sullivan County, and other areas. The you know, Related to that, um, there was a provision that I read about, and I haven't had a chance to really research it yet, um, $15 internet service. Um, can you explain that? Do you, are you, you're familiar with that, I'm sure. I am. So, you know, look, I would tell you, you know, a couple of things. Certainly, I think that's a very positive thing. And then, I'll, of course, I'll, I'll caveat that with if you have high-speed internet service where you right. live. Because unfortunately, certainly for the folks that I represent, so many of them don't even have internet service to begin with. But I think you know, I was supportive of the $15 internet service plan, uh, mainly because what's clear today is broadband is not a luxury, it is a necessity. You know, we are all working from home. So many of our, our students are still studying from home. Uh, so, you know, for me, really, this, this is, needs to be a two-pronged approach, which is first, make sure that internet service is available. And again, mm -hmm. I'm one of the senators uh, in the chamber who does not have internet service available to all of my constituents as it stands today. So really, you know, while I think it is important that we address internet affordability and I'm supportive of it, I feel like that's sort of step two. And again, so many of the people that I represent haven't made it past step one yet, which is making sure that they actually have the service to begin with. Um, because certainly those senators that represent New York City, Long Island, uh, Westchester County, the Lower Hudson Valley, don't have any of the issues that we're discussing here with respect to internet availability. Uh, but again, I was, I was supportive of the provisions of making sure that low cost internet is available. But again, specifically because right now we know all the things that broadband supporting, it's way beyond the luxury at this point. And, and you know, I was supportive of that measure. Educate me a little bit. How is that $15 broadband uh, going, to, going to work? That's, uh, we're not saying that all broadband is gonna cost $15 in New York State now. That's correct, right. So what it, what it basically calls on providers to do is develop an affordable package, right? So um, you know that package may look different depending upon the specific area that okay. you're located in. Uh, and you're right, it would be what, essentially a very basic internet package, right? Okay. Um, so it probably would not be a package that uh, you know, everyone would choose potentially to use, but again, it would be something that's available in communities, uh, spe specifically those communities of highest need um, you know, where folks may not be able to afford internet service. The other piece is, and the other good news is, in a lot of these communities of high need, uh, other marginalized communities, you already have, in many cases, municipal internet service that's been built out or some other systems that meet and fill these requirements. So, uh -huh. um, you know. Sort of like the, the, the lifeline packages that a lot of telephone companies offer, um, that, you know, very basic service, you're not going to get one gig service for fifteen dollars a month. That's um, correct. But it, it's something to provide that lifeline. Um, you know, one of the the I thought was going to be a real hot issue, and and really hasn't, at least not yet, um, is the legalization of of marijuana. Um, let's talk about that a little bit. Where did where did you fall down on that one? So Ray, I, um, I did not vote in favor of legalization, uh, but I'll explain why. I really only had one issue with the bill. And my issue with the bill was I didn't believe that it properly addressed the issue of traffic safety. Uh, mm -hmm. Look, you know, I would tell you that um, I think that there are plenty of risky behaviors one can, can engage in. Certainly, uh, there are also uh, plenty of legal uh, means that have addictive qualities like alcohol and cigarette smoking. So, you know, as I look at marijuana, certainly there's a, there is an economic opportunity to be had. It's a benefit to our farmers in some cases, uh, some of our farmers being able to take advantage of the grow license portion. Um, so I think there were good aspects of the marijuana legalization bill. But again, for me, uh, what I was most worried about, frankly, is I don't want somebody getting high and going on the road and hurting you or a member of your family sure. and creating a public safety issue. So uh, you know, for me, without specific protections to detect and prosecute people who are driving impaired under the influence of marijuana, I couldn't support the bill, which was the main reason that I voted in the negative. That's interesting. That was exactly what what we what I heard earlier from from Chris Tag. Um, yeah, I mean, 
But again, and I think that what I'm here to say though is today I recognize that it's law and I've committed to the farmers that I represent and the other yeah. businesses that I will be helpful now helping us get into the market. Because again, I would tell you that my opposition lied only in the only in the realm of public safety. Sure. And um, but now I think that both Chris and I look forward to making sure that Delaware County and the areas we represent can best benefit from this program. So, Mike, we got a couple minutes. Pull out your crystal ball. What's coming up yet this session? Oh, so these these are some good questions. I mean, look, you know, I would tell you what I would like to see come up this session, <laughs> but but unfortunately, I think that there are going to be a couple of measures um, that that will be of of great concern to me. You know, let's talk about the first one, which is the fate of our governor. Um, I would like to see something something significant done with the serious allegations that have been lodged against our governor. Um, you know, certainly there are several parallel investigations that are going on in the assembly where Chris takes sits. There's an impeachment investigation that's underway by the Democrat majority. Our attorney general, Letitia James, is doing an investigation on the nine accusers uh, that have accused Governor Cuomo of misconduct. And then the feds are doing an investigation on the nursing homes as it surrounds obstruction of justice, having to do with 15,000 folks that perished in nursing homes um, from what I believe was a, a deadly executive order issued by the governor. So I would say the first thing is uh, we have to get talking about what's going to happen with our executive, because again, I charge that given all that surrounds the governor right now, it's going to be tremendously difficult for him to continue to do his job. So I think that as a legislature, we have an obligation to fully investigate that. Um, and I certainly hope that politics can get out of the way and we can get to the people's business in terms of working on that important matter. So uh, that I think should be, should be top of the list. But um, it is but Albany, it is Albany and it's all about politics. It is. The, the other thing, Ray, that I would like to see taken up in this, this second half of the session is finally addressing the arbitrary and capricious executive orders that are still in place today, which should have been repealed long ago. We talk about our restaurant industry right now, which is on its knees, and we still have an 11 o'clock curfew that isn't backed by one ounce of science at all. Um, and, and I can think of many, many other executive orders. By the way, that's the number one thing I'm hearing from small businesses in my district, which is we have to do something with all these restrictions and orders. So those are the things that I would like to see us do when we go back up there on the 19th. In fact, we should have handled those things long ago. Yeah. Uh, no reason they shouldn't have been done already, but those would be Mike Martucci's priorities. Now, unfortunately, what I suspect is that the majorities have a different set of priorities, um, but I can think of nothing more urgent than the things that I'm talking to you about right now with respect to reopening our economy. Because- well Let's well, let's get that eleven let's get that eleven o'clock curfew removed because that actually it's running contrary to to public health because what you're doing is you're taking people from a controlled environment and you're pushing them into into homes home parties and the like where there's no controls. You are absolutely so, correct, and I, I mean the final thing that I would say is at the end of the day what we know, especially with vaccination rates rising steadily, is that we do not have to continue to hurt our economy and our businesses to ensure public safety. We're doing social distances, we're using masks, we're getting vaccinations. All these things are happening. It's finally time to reopen our economy, Ray. We have to do it, we should have done it long ago. And that's my number one priority when we go back on the 19th. Excellent. Mike, you got a great team that works with you. How can folks get in contact with you and, and your team at one of your district offices? So the best way to get a hold of us, we have two district offices, one in Middletown and one in Liberty. Uh, the best way to get a hold of us is 845-344-3311. And uh, we also take our show on the road thanks to our great friends like Ray at the Delaware Valley Chambers. So we do remote office hours in all sorts of places, including in conjunction with the Chambers. So we hope yeah. to be back soon. Good. We're always happy to see Camille come. Yes. She, does it, she and the rest of your team, really, uh, they, do a, they do a great job and uh, getting out and around and, uh, as they say, flying the colors a little bit to, um, to, to serve that constituents uh, in, in that very large district. Mike Martucci, thanks for joining me this afternoon on Catskills Commerce. We're going to have to do this again soon, friend. Absolutely. Yeah. It's always my pleasure to be here. Great. Thanks again. You stay well and, and keep up the good fight. You too. And thank you for joining us this after joining me here this afternoon on Catskills Commerce. It's always a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned a couple of things. I know I certainly did. Um, 
Stay tuned. Coming up in just a few seconds is a special edition of Pop Up, uh, and stay tuned for that. Always interesting and entertaining. And as for me, gosh, I think I'm going to be back in about another month with a new edition of Catskills Commerce. See you then.